Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to see so many of you here. I hope you, like I, had a great lunch. I hope you don't fall asleep after lunch, uh, and that I'll have something interesting for you to listen to. So, I'm a professor in information systems at Umeå University. Umeå is in the northern part of Sweden. And as you saw, that's where we have the big municipalities, but no people, basically. Um, but Umeå city has about 120,000 uh, inhabitants, and uh, we're a big university town. So that's where I come from. Um, looking at some of, let me see if I can get that correct. There we go. Um, some of the trends, what is going on in our society? Well, technology is getting smaller, cheaper, and smarter. Uh, and as I heard you say, what do we do? We install sensors all over the place, right? Uh, this has a collective name, Internet of Things, IoT. And IoT is basically when you put sensors into the environment or add them to products, um, and you collect data, real-time data, and you analyze it, and you try to do something smart with it. Uh, we also, of course, see the current trend of incorporating artificial intelligence into all different aspects of life, uh, where we use self-learning algorithms to solve problems, see patterns, and make decisions. And uh, if you look at... Um, uh, the Swedish, I wouldn't say there is a, a full strategy for AI, but what they have pointed out is the three areas of support, augment, and replace. So we use artificial intelligence to support humans in what they're doing, right? That's one way of using AI. Another way is to augment, to make better uh, what we're already doing. And a third way, which is often what we see in all the movies, is when AI replaces humans, right? We have the smart computer or the robots take over. Uh, well, we're not quite there yet, but it is a fact that technology is developing and is becoming uh, a more integrated um, part of our everyday lives, right? And if you look to the right, you see some examples of where Internet of Things technology is already being used. For example, uh, as you said, with road maintenance, light poles, intelligent street lights that light up when people come close uh, and that don't turn on when there are no people there. Right? And they are also designed to give a sense of safety because we know that citizens feel unsafe going into dark spaces. So you don't want to have dark and then boom, light turns on. You want it to gradually turn on. And so this is the way the sensors are used to create um, an intelligent, so to speak, setting uh, that's adapted to human behavior. So. Um, Toasters, plants, trash bins, footballs, and football players are also connected to the internet. If you watched the last World Cup, we could get statistics on each individual player, how far they had run during a game. Uh, we can also, by placing sensors in football, see how hard they kick, for example, right? Hockey players, you see that all the time, how hard they shoot the puck. Um, and so we are partly slowly and partly very quickly moving into, um, uh, moving into a world that's connected and where huge amounts of data are being generated and analyzed. Uh, in 2017 and 18, we did a study, uh, me and my colleagues, where we asked municipalities, how do you, if you do, use uh, IoT technology, so Internet of Things technology? We asked around 1,300 municipalities, 337 answered, so we're happy about that, uh, in Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and Estonia. And uh, what we could see, and so you have to take into account that this is five years ago, 
things could have changed, but I can tell you they haven't changed all that much. Um, the vast majority of IoT projects that were going on were focused on key infrastructural areas. The red is for utilities and environment, uh, and the blue is for transportation and infrastructure. So it's not a surprise that smart road maintenance is something that has been developed because this has been uh, something that not only in Estonia but in in the Nordic countries that has been a great focus to provide better infrastructure, better transportation, uh, better um, utilities also goes waste management for example uh, or monitoring water flows and waste water flows using sensor technology to do that uh, and you can see uh, and buildings is the orange one so also facility management is actually pretty big part of this. Uh, but you can see the areas where at least five years ago it was not as developed and that would be um, uh, care and support which if you listen to the speakers today care and support is really something that uh, we need to find solutions for in the future. But this is also something that's very close to individuals, right, to humans. It's easier to place sensors along a road and monitor road maintenance than it is to change elderly care with the use of sensor technology. Not that it's not being done, but it's not quite as easy. Um, crime prevention is partly happening, uh, but this is much more of a thing in the United States, for example, where IoT systems are being used. Not only here, if you look at the Nordic countries, it's mostly about monitoring, so using cameras and um, having connected cameras to see how people move th through cities and so on. Uh, but in the States, for example, there are also gun smoke detectors, so that you can trace real crime in real time. But all of this is based on the idea that data is the new gold. Okay, so data is what's going to change our world. Uh, and you know, at the end of the rainbow, there is normally one pot of gold, but when it comes to data, we get four. So what we're looking to get from data is improved effectiveness, increased efficiency, more transparency and also increased collaboration and I think if you also go back to the other speakers today we've heard a lot of talk about this improving efficiency becoming more transparent interacting with citizens um, and also uh, collaborating right uh, uh, between different uh, levels of government, but also with the public, right? Well, okay, so what is smart about smart societies? Because this smartness um, concept is being used, I would say, sometimes it's like, it's hard to tell. What, 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 why is it smart? You know, does something become smart just because we add technology to it? Uh, well, no, right? Um, but if you look at the four pots of gold, if you look at effectiveness, well, it's about a more sustainable and innovative use of new technology. So a smart society, or because it doesn't have to be a city, right? It could be a smart municipality, uh, makes use of new technology in an effective way. So they get something out of it that they're actually wanting to get out of it. It's also about a better use of resources and streamlined processes. So um, if we want to invest in technology, we can do it uh, to have a cool solution to a problem, right? But we can also use it to find out things, for example, about road maintenance or about how our cleaners are moving about in a building to see can we use these resources in a better way, right? Um, in uh, 
my municipality, uh, there was a, a project where uh, they connected local municipal buildings, um, offices, common areas, and so on, and uh, also the restrooms. And then based on the information from that IoT system, the cleaners would get information of where they should go to clean. Right? So they went from routine-based cleaning, where they went through the same rooms every day, to actually getting data of these rooms have been used. Okay? If they haven't been used, we shouldn't go there, we shouldn't clean. If they have been used, we should go, and maybe this room has been used a lot, like so many people pass through here today, so we need to go there twice today to keep it clean, right? So this restructured the entire way of the cleaning services for their work um, based on the data they were getting from, uh, from the sensors that were placed in the rooms, right? Um, using technology can also, as I said, increase transparency and citizen engagement. And I know of an example from Estonia, I don't know where it was, but I know that it's from here, um, where sensors were put in snow plows, right? So when you, for road maintenance, when you plow the snow in the winter. And so the information of how the plows were moving was displayed on a map where the public could see it. Right? So it increased the transparency of where is the plow and when is it coming to my neighborhood? Can I take the car today or do I have to walk through the snow? Right? So that was very good, except that when you increase transparency, people feel like they have a right to tell you what to do. Why are you going to that road first? You know, you should have planned it differently. You should come to my house uh, because it's alongside a more important road and so on. Um, so what started out as a service was eventually shut down because <laughs> there was too much, uh, too much transparency. Can there be too much transparency? Uh, better collaboration and need-based value creation. Well, okay, so need-based value creation is doing things because we have a purpose of doing them, not just because we can. So we're not investing in technology just because we can or we feel that, uh, well, we have to in order to keep up with our neighbors and so on. We're investing in technology because we have a purpose of changing something, right? Uh, that's being smart. So, what's the reality then? Well, in practice, realization of economic value usually takes precedence over other types of value creation. Uh, so, we heard earlier about, well, we should also focus on creating, um, on looking at societal value, looking at process value, how we change processes, right? Well, what we see is that a lot of these innovation projects, they end up looking only at economic value. And when they do, they usually only lead to incremental innovation, so small steps, right? But what we want to do, if we're going to transform, is to have radical innovation, to do something differently, and I think you said so earlier today as well, that we don't want to keep on doing the same things, just a little bit better. We want to do new things. We want to experiment. We want to come up with new ways of going about our daily lives. Because what we're doing right now is not sustainable. Okay? So we have to start thinking differently. But then it becomes really, really interesting to see that in practice, we are not thinking differently. We are doing more of the same, just a little bit different, okay? But if we want to become data-driven, because that's what it's usually called, becoming data-driven, taking advantage of all this data that we're collecting from millions of sensors all over the place, what do we want to do? Well, um, if you look at it from an organizational level, you have to develop five core elements. Uh, you have to, first of all, think about the data that you have. Is it relevant? Is it contextualized? Is it harmonized? So 
you know, just collecting stuff just because we can, well, you know, that doesn't lead to change. It just leads to big data repositories, right? So we have to think of what data are we collecting and why. We need to develop data capabilities. Uh, so organizational ca capabilities where we purposefully manage data. Uh, we need to work on developing a data-driven culture, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in the coming slides. But basically, that's about fostering a belief system, a value system, where we embrace data-driven practices, where we actually see that this is good. This is something we want to do. This helps us in some way. Right? And this is the human element is the hardest part to any transition. Uh, and then data-driven decision-making, so we want to make rational decisions based on data. And I'll tell you about rationality also in a bit. And hopefully this will then lead to data-driven value, uh, data value creation. Okay, so we do all these things, we create the conditions that are conducive to change, and then we create value. And then it looks like this a lot of the times, usually. We're a data-driven company. We collect millions of data points every day. We clean the data, we analyze it, we turn it into actionable insights, and then we implement whatever is the mood of the day. I think we've all seen it. Uh, so, my point is that increasing the amount of information does not necessarily lead to the anticipated change in behaviors. And anyone who's been in contact with children know that this is the truth, right? Um, so sometimes you can have all the information you need, but people don't change. They don't change their behaviors. And why is that so? Well, because people are complex. Right? People are not rational. Even though we like to think that we are, we're really not. Uh, people are affected by moods. What's the mood of the day? Right? If we're happy, we might make certain kinds of decisions. If we're not, we tend to make different types of decisions. Um, there was a study by a psychologist in Sweden who asked the question, what would make people buy environmentally friendly products? You know, what, what affects their decision to buy these products? And he found out that it was not the cost, which is often uh, used as an argument. They're too expensive, you know, that's why people don't buy them. The two things that influenced people the most was one, is anyone else doing it? Okay? So people are social creatures. And if everyone else is doing it, then maybe I want to do it as well. And this is even on a subconscious level. That's why fashion eventually makes everyone look pretty much the same. Because if everyone is doing it, you know, that's kind of what's offered to you as well. And that's the direction people tend to go. So if we see more people doing it, we will be more likely to do it as well. And the other factor was if it was noticeable or not. Which meant that if I did something, I bought a product that was environmentally friendly, but no one else saw it, that would make me less likely to actually buy something. But if I, for example, bought, um, brought with me, you know, like an uh, organically grown banana to work, and people could see that, look, she's bringing in something, right? Uh, that's good for the environment, it would make me more likely to do it. So it's, is anyone else doing it? And how are they uh, seeing what we're doing? Okay, so we have this whole thing about visibility. And the thing about IoT, Internet of Things, it's that it can make what is invisible become visible, which could lead to increased trust and transparency. So following that line of reasoning, if it increases visibility and people can see me do stuff, then I'm more likely to behave in a certain manner. That's expected or that's wanted, right? 
But the thing about technology, and specifically IoT, is that it can also have the opposite effect. So increased visibility can also lead to increased control, because when we see things, we try to want to control them. Uh, and people generally don't like too much control before they start to try to work around the system, right? And the thing about IoT is that you can both be a user of the system and a data point in the system at the same time. So if you go back to the cleaners, they're moving through the hallways with their cleaning carts, right? They are using the information from the sensors placed in the buildings to perform their work. They are, at that time, being the observer. They're observing their environment through the use of data. But as they move through the building, they are also triggering sensors, right? Presence sensors. So they are a data point in the system that they are using. And at that point, they are being observed. Most people like being the observer. Not that many people like being the observer. And this is something that we just have to handle, right? So we have to take this into account when we build systems for uh, our businesses or for our municipalities, for our citizens. I can give you an example from elderly care. There was um, an experiment, an experimental apartment, where they were allowed to go into um, an elderly person's home and install sensors. So the idea was to learn from the person's behaviors. She usually got up at a certain time, and then that would trigger a sensor, a movement sensor. You could see movement leaving the bed, right? There was a sensor for the water, because this person usually made coffee in the morning, right? So the idea was if the water turns on, you know, the person is about to make coffee. So she's up and about. Right? She hasn't fallen and hurt herself, and, you know, she seems to be all right. So there were sensors installed in the environment, and the idea was, with this project, that if something did not seem quite right, the right sensors weren't triggered in the way we expected them to, an alarm would go out to this person's relatives, right? So they could call and say, hi, mom, what's going on? Or hi, grandma, right? Um, and up until that point, because these people were doing it voluntarily, right? So they had volunteered to be part of the project. And up until that point, they were fine with being monitored and observed for their safety. But when you incorporated family into it, they said, my kids don't need to know what I'm doing, right? I'm a grown person. I don't want them to see my every movement throughout the day. So they said, but if a nurse would see this, I would be fine, right? Because then we have a distance. So this is also a cultural thing. In Sweden, I think Sweden is often talked about as the most individualistic society on earth, where you would expect a, to be... Um, feel safe to have your family be able to kind of see you without seeing you, uh, they said, no, that's not respecting my privacy, right? But to have an outside organization do it, that was fine. So you kind of also have to look at the observed or being the observer uh, in the context of culture, right? Where are you and what is acceptable in this culture? What else can be done? Well, if you want to become data-driven, if you want to work with sensor technology, for example. Uh, well, we have to increase the understanding of technological capabilities, show what the technology can do. And that includes actually talking about, okay, this is what we can see, including this is what we can learn about you, maybe, right? Uh, also, it's important to establish leadership, to 
um, have someone that drives this change. And what is really, really interesting is that in that first study that we did, where we asked all the municipalities about if they used IoT or not, we did not see a difference between large municipalities and small municipalities. Where we saw a difference was where they had an active leadership or not, right? Where there was someone driving that change, where someone was engaged and wanted to drive change, you would see lots of projects, you would see lots of funding applications for EU money and so on. Um, and where there wasn't, well, you know, it didn't matter if it was a large or a small municipality. When it comes to technological innovation, you have to have people who drive the change, and you have to put it at a strategic level. If it just stays within an IT department, it becomes really hard uh, to do anything else than individual projects. If you want it to be incorporated into the entire organization, municipal organization, um, you need to place it at a strategic level. And for that, you need leadership. Another thing to do, which is of what a lot of these projects are about, is about nudging. So there is actually a theory called nudging theory. And it's about eliciting a desired behavior by giving individuals a push in a certain direction. So I told you, people don't like to be told what to do. Um, but a little nudge can work instead. And so what do we do? Well, we use data to raise awareness. Uh, for example, for during the pandemic, when people started working from home, a lot of people, at least around uh, where I am, installed uh, different apps that would uh, notify you when you'd been sitting at your computer for too long and say, come on, get up, take a break, move around, do something, right? Because we didn't get those natural breaks that we normally get from an ordinary workday uh, when we go to the coffee room, for example, right? Uh, so raise awareness of what is going on. There is a project right now that, um, that has put sensors into work clothes to see how people are, move, they are doing heavy lifting, for example, so to see are they using, you know, ergonomically appropriate techniques to do lifting. And if not, you know, it can buzz them or something, you know, to raise awareness. Okay, you need to be conscious of how you're moving about. Another trend is gamification. So we give awards and achievements um, based on data. For example, anyone who has a smartwatch that counts your steps, right? That's gamification. They give you a little woohoo, 8,000 steps or 10,000 steps, right? That it's a nudging to get people to do what you want. Except that I know a lot of people, when you get that little buzzer that says, okay, you haven't moved enough in this hour, they start doing this. To get, to get the steps. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but also to show trends over time. And we have a project um, in Sweden. Uh, there was a municipality that worked with schools, with children, to show them how to be sustainable. So basically, they measured how much food was thrown in the cafeteria. Uh, and they were displaying this on screens to the children to make them either eat whatever they had on their plates or just not take as much food so to, to let it go to waste. Um, but in the end, uh, to summarize, the digitalization of municipalities looking ahead is going to be a lot about becoming data-driven. And in order to become data-driven, we need to think about the different values that we can get out of becoming data-driven. And we also need to consider the culture that we are actually operating within. The great thing about Internet of Things is that it can provide you with contextual data, contextual real-time data. So it is very uh, tailored to the specific context where it is in but you can use the data to draw larger conclusions. I'd like to conclude with uh, Amara's law. Roy Amara was a future um, 
studies. He, he was heading the Institute of Future Studies in the States, and he said, actually quite some time ago, but it still holds today, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. So basically, we want to see change and we want to see it quickly, and if we don't, we say, oh, maybe that was just not successful. But what we need to do is to look at the long game. Okay? Um, and uh, if you look at technology trends, you will see that they do pick up eventually. First there is a boom, and then there is a drop, and then it goes back up eventually. So that was it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting indeed. Um, we've received a few questions on AI, uh, something that uh, uh, is coming uh, clearly. But what is the use uh, or what kind of potential do you see on the municipality level in, in using AI? Because we, as we generate a lot of data with our smart sensors, perhaps it's too much for uh, a human mind to grasp this and AI should start sorting out things. Absolutely, and it's already being done, I would say. Um, we need more data analysts, we do, but they cannot sit and crunch data from millions of data points, right? So we do need AI to do that, and that's what I meant with the support, augment, replace. So some data analysis can be used, you use an AI to do, maybe to support, what you're already doing, your processes, uh, to augment them, or actually to take the human out of the loop. Uh, and I think we will see it at all levels, really. Speaking of humans becoming, uh, well, exiting uh, this... Uh, struggling finding the right word. Uh, anyway, uh, speaking of, uh, of AI and human cooperation, would you list three professions at local governments that will most likely be taken over by AI in the near future? Ooh. Someone from the audience wants to <laughs> put to fire first. Um. No, this is really interesting because I, I don't have a good answer for that. But I can tell you this, that there are always lists coming out and which jobs will be obsolete and which jobs will become, uh, you know, more popular. Someone told me quite some time ago that one of the jobs of the future uh, with all this data and data sharing, not the least, is a lawyer because, <laughs> you know, uh, to figure things out, who should have access, who shouldn't, uh, how do we make these agreements uh, and ensure the safety and so on of everyone. Uh, but when it comes to AI, um, what, what's talked about right now a lot with chat GPT, you know, hitting the world is basically do we need people who can write anymore, right? We have an AI that can do uh, minutes from meetings, uh, that can um, write good brochures for the citizens, uh, so, you know, uh, to provide information in an easy way. Uh, but then, if you look at that, then, okay, so we don't need the writers. Well, then we need the people who can prompt the AI, right? Who can write the correct instructions to the AI to get it to produce what you actually want. So, we're shifting. A little bit, mm. but I'm not sure we're just, you know, putting people out of the picture. Large part of the municipality budget in Estonia goes to education. What kind of examples of using better data uh, could you bring with uh, improving basic education services? Someone from the audience asks. Um, hmm. It depends on what you mean when you say education services. Uh, what is being used right now um, is I, the way we've seen it right now is that you fo they have focused on the things that are uh, not human-centered because it's harder to solve. So they've focused on, for example, school buildings. How can we provide a better indoor climate for our students, right? So they have a better environment to learn in. Um, so, but that's, you know, fixing the environment around education. Then, of course, um, 
we can use data on if you want to collect. We can use data to plan better. Uh, for example, if you have schedules for your children uh, for aftercare, if they stay after school, and then so how long is everyone staying? When do we have the most? Do we see trends of the year when, well, we already know because we have that type of data, right, that in February uh, everyone's sick, uh, basically, in Sweden. So anyone who has children is sick in February. You don't need AI to tell. So we, we don't need AI to that, but we you do need data. have sensors in your head. <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> but we do need data, and once we have data, we can start planning also. Mm -hmm. in a better way, yeah. Thank you very much, Ulrich. Thank it you. was very nice <laughs> and exciting. Thank you.